Hello. This lecture will cover pages 1 through 8 of my lecture notes. Please print those pages out and have them in front of you as I present this lecture on Introductory Concepts Part A, Analog and Digital Quantities. If you take a look starting on page number 1, Numerical Representations of Values. There are two basic ways of representing numerical values of quantities. One is analog and the second way is digital. If you're an electrical engineer, you're probably going to have a choice to either go into analog electrical engineering or digital electrical engineering or power electrical engineering. But right now we're going to we're going to look at the differences between analog and digital quantities. Analog implies that the information is represented by variables that are continuous time. Therefore, analog is synonymous with continuous. Um, the next course, EE210, we're going to spend a lot of time, it's all analog, but I want to mention it right now so you know what, what it's all about. Examples of analog waveforms include the sine wave, the bottom of page number one, and uh, the sine wave is the most popular analog representation because it happens naturally in the real world, but let's take a look at a sinusoidal waveform here on my whiteboard. Notice the abscissa axis is time, usually the x-axis. The ordinate axis or the y-axis can be voltage with respect to time or current with respect to time and I'm showing it as voltage here and I pick some values. I picked the peak value of this sine wave is 10 volts and I kept it symmetrical so the negative peak is minus 10 volts and it's about the zero voltage axis. Notice that one repetition or one cycle of that waveform defines what we call a period. Now in electrical engineering, you'll find out next semester, there's, just, there's about five or six concepts, equations and concepts, if you will, that once you understand them, it holds the basis for most of electrical engineering. Probably the first one we're going to look at, besides Ohm's law, is going to be this one here called the frequency equation, where the frequency is equal to one over this period. So this period is, is, is in seconds. So if you take the inverse of the period, you'll get the frequency in cycles per second. Now, back in 1968, the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers, IEEE, they decided they're not going to represent frequency in cycles per second. The units are not going to be cycles per second anymore. So you'll never hear that. You'll hear hertz. Hertz is cycles per second. So frequency is 1 over the period in Hertz. And the reciprocal of this formula, you can see, is the period is 1 over the frequency in seconds. So this equation right here is very, very important. Determine the frequency from the period. And it works for any repetitive waveform, analog and digital. If you take a look here, I'm showing you a triangular wave. Notice the period goes from this point here, the zero crossing, if you will, at this point, positive slope, and at this positive slope. So you can pick a period from this point to this point. That would define one period. Down here in the sawtooth waveform, let's take a look at it. We're going to pick it from this point here to this point here. That would be one period of the waveform. Or you could take the positive slope zero crossing from this point to this point. That would define one period, same period. Analog waveforms are synonymous with continuous waves. There's no discontinuities with analog. If you look on page number three, on page three we're going to talk about digital. Now, for this course, that's what's important. This is a digital systems class. So, digital implies that the information is represented by variables that take on a limited number of discrete values with time. Therefore, digital is synonymous with discrete or step-by-step. -step. Here are four examples or five total examples of digital waveforms. The first four, A, B, C, and D, are all binary waveforms because they represent two different states. In other words, let's take a look at A and B and C and D and let's assume for just a minute here, we could pick any values, but let's assume that this point here is zero volts or a zero logic level for our application here. And this is five volts, and five volts is going to be referred to as a one logic level, binary. Zeros and ones can be represented many different ways. You'll find out in a future lecture. But for now, zero volts is a zero, 
and 5 volts is a 1. So this waveform varies between 0 and a logic 1. 0 and a logic 1. Matter of fact, all these waveforms do that. They're digital waveforms. There's only two steps. They're, they're binary waveforms, rather. There's only two steps. Down here at the bottom, we have a digitized sine wave. This is not a sinusoidal waveform. It's a digital waveform. Because let's take a look here. Let's just make up some numbers. Here's zero volts. Let's make each one of these steps one volt. It goes one volt, two volts, three volts, four volts, and it steps back down to zero. Then it goes negative one, negative two, negative three, and negative four. So the voltage varies from negative four through zero to plus four volts. It only happens, the waveform only has values at discrete steps. There's a two volt reference, there's a three volt reference, and there's a so forth. There's no 2.5 volts. You can't, th this waveform doesn't have 2.5 volts. It doesn't have 3.1 volts. It doesn't have 4.75 volts. It only has those discrete steps. It's a digitized waveform. Not a binary one, but a digital one. Let's go back up here for a second and let's look at these digital waveforms. I'm going to I'm going to define something right now called duty cycle on these waveforms and we're going to get to it in about three weeks or four weeks, but I want to mention it now. So you might want to just write this in here somewhere on page three. I'm going to define something called duty cycle, percent duty cycle. And I'm going to say that the duty cycle is going to be defined this way in a digital waveform. Here's a digital waveform. We'll do it this way. Make sure you can see that. And we're going to call this the time low and we're going to call this the time high and we're going to define this point right here as one period that's the period of the waveform that's when it starts repeating so the percent duty cycle is going to be equal to in our definition it's going to be the time high divided by the time low plus the time high times 100 percent. If you take a look at that waveform, that denominator can be represented a different way. I think you all agree that you can look at that denominator time low plus time high and that's the period. So here's an equation we're going to use for percent duty cycle. Percent duty cycle is equal to the time high divided by the total period times 100%. So if you take a look here at waveform A, what duty cycle? Oh, without giving you specific numbers, let's look in generalities. I want you to look at waveform A and can you see that's a 50% duty cycle? That's what a 50% duty cycle waveform looks like. Look at B. That's what a 50% duty cycle, a different frequency, but that's what a 50% duty cycle looks like. What about C? Look at that. Stop the video and think about it. And then come back with the video. That's what a 10% duty cycle, approximately a 10% duty cycle would look like. And what about D? That's what an 80% duty cycle would look like. On page number four, there's an exercise. He says, which of the following involve analog quantities and which involve digital quantities? I want you to look through these, A through I, and I want you to look at the answers and make sure in this course you can recognize analog qual quantities and digital quantities. Down at the bottom of page four, it says the real world, also called the physical world that we live in, it's an analog world. All these different temperature, pressure, levels of a liquid in a tank, position of an object on a conveyor belt, or an angular position from zero to 360 degrees. In the real world, generation of voltage or current. In the real world, these are all analog. Think about it. They're all analog representations, the physical quantity being that, that's, that's, uh, that can be measured is analog. However, on page number five, if we convert analog quantities to digital quantities and use only digital values, there are many advantages to be gained. 
Take your time and look through each one of these one through six. These are all the advantages of going to digital systems over analog systems. Let's discuss number six, noise. We're not talking about a rock band here. We're talking about we're talking about electromagnetic interference, EMI, or radio frequency interference, RFI. Digital circuits are less affected by noise. Let's take a look here on page five and page six. I'll explain why. If you look at a typical analog amplifier, what it's going to do is it's going to amplify everything it sees. So if you have a sinusoidal waveform with noise writing on that, it's going to amplify that. As a matter of fact, if we take a wire, this is called Lenz's Law, by the way. If I stretch a wire across the classroom and I ground one side of it and I ground the other side of it, Lenz's Law says as long as that's a conductor, a metal, it has to be a metal conductor. Can't be fiber optic cable. Fiber optic cable doesn't exhibit this characteristic I'm going to show you. But these ballasts you have in the classroom, they're going to bombard that wire. Electromagnetic interference coming from radio antennas, television transmissions. They're going to bombard that wire and they're going to generate white noise, noise on that wire. They'll generate voltages on that wire. And if you have a sinusoidal waveform and you're trying to transmit and filter a sinusoidal waveform and it has noise on it, that noise on a pure analog amplifier will get generated, to, will get amplified too. It amplifies everything, the, the sinusoid waveform and the noise it rides on top of it. Now, you electrical engineers will find out that you'll have differential amplifiers that will take out that common mode rejection. Let's don't worry about that. Let's worry about the basics of the analog amplifier and how it'll, in its basic state, amplifies everything. But how does the, how does the digital amplifier, how does it, how is it immune to noise? Well, if you take a look here, we have a waveform 0 to 5 volts gone into this digital amplifier, and what we get out is a clean 0 to 5 volts. Why? Because noise that's riding on this input waveform, this white noise that's riding on the input waveform, it turns out that any voltage less than or equal to 0.8 volts looks like a good low to this circuit here. In, t in TTL, or transistor-transistor logic, which we work with this whole s semester, this is the way it works. If it's 0.8 volts or less, it looks like a solid zero to this digital amplifier. And any input voltage greater than 2 volts, from 2 to 5 volts, as long as this noise riding up here doesn't come low enough to take it below 2 volts, you don't even see that noise. That digital amplifier is completely immune to that noise. That's what we mean by digital systems are less affected by noise. And then in page 7, I want you to look at page 7, a closed loop digital control system. And I want you to look at page 8. Turn page 8 landscape and look at page 7 at the same time. Because we're going to talk about to take advantage of digital techniques when dealing with analog inputs uh, and outputs, four steps must be followed. Well, basically, you can go through those four steps, but let me describe this to you here. What we're going to have is a tank. The tank's going to have liquid in it, some liquid. And we have a temperature sensor here. This temperature sensor is a strain gauge pressure tran uh, temperature transducer. You can buy it at Radio Shack or go online, buy it for a couple bucks. And we're going to assume it's linear. They're really not linear. They have a little bit of an S shape to them. But let's assume that this is linear. And here's a little uh, graph I put up here. If you have 0 volts, there's 0 degrees C. If you have 5 volts, there's 50 degrees C. And if you have 100 volts being measured at this line here, it's going to be a... 100 degrees C. And so you can see here, if you read 2.5 volts on this line, the temperature is 25 degrees C. If you read 7.5 volts on this line, according to this graph, you're going to be at 75 degrees C in here. And we're going to go through an analog to digital converter. Don't worry about the circuitry, but it basically takes this analog world input and it digitizes it. I'm showing as a nibble four bits up here. This N can be 2 bits, it can be 4 bits, it can be 8 or 16 or 32 or 64 bits, but we digitize it and we put it into this system. 
and we use a microprocessor or a microcontroller or a programmable logic controller or some other type of computer system to to work on that data and make a decision to, to output the signal to go through the digital to analog converter here to go back to turn this heater on based on this characteristics for the heater. Why do we do that? Why don't we just keep it in terms of the analog world? Why do we take the analog to digital converter, get it into digital format, and then why are we taking it back from the digital to the analog world by using a D to A converter? Well, if you think about it, the reason we're doing it is because of the top of page number five, because we get these six advantages here. So basically, based on the temperature, we can set a desired temperature and when we reach it we can output and we can turn this heater up, turn this heater down, whatever. Based on no heat at zero volts here, 50% heat at five volts, and full heat on this heating element at 10 volts. And it's linear too. And we have seven segment displays down here. They're just LEDs. We have three of them. And based on what we what we want to set as a desired temperature, you can see the the digital indication right here, up to 99.9 .9 degrees. So we're looking at a closed loop digital control system. And if you go through these four steps, you can understand why we want to go the analog world into the digital world and from digital back to the analog. And that concludes this lecture.